Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James grounded family Bible study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Numbers chapter 15. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land of your habitations. That's important. What did God just say? He says, You're going in that land. Well, he just told a group of people, chapter 14, You're not going in that land. Anyone 20 years old and upward. Are not going in that land. Those 19 and under. Are going in. So. No one can say. Well God's all finished with Israel. Because he's going to put them in the land. Number one. Number two. God. He just told. Many people. I don't know what the number of Israel is. From 20 years old. He just told them. You're not going in the promised land. We read that. Chapter 14. And now the next chapter we see God speaking. He said, well, your children are going to go in. That's a kick in the butt to them. Because here they left Egypt thinking here they're going to the promised land. And they had defied God. They had unbelief in God. They didn't trust in God. They're griping. They're complaining. God finally said, I'm done. You're not going in. And when you come into the land. Now he's not speaking. When you come into the land. He's not speaking to all the children of Israel. He's speaking to those that are 19 and under. Except for Caleb and uh, um, Joshua, which I give unto you. Now, that's a kick in the butt. And I will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, or a sacrifice in performing a vow, or a free will offering, or in your solemn feast to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the herd or the flock. Then shall he that offer his offering to the Lord bring a meat offering. We've already discussed that through Leviticus 1, 2, 3, 4. A meat offering of a tenth deal of flour mingled with a fourth part of a hen of oil. So you're going to bring your meat offering and God is already going to tell you what that meat or God's going to tell you through all these offerings what you need to bring. It's like almost like, I hate to put it like this, but like a cookbook. God says this is the prof profound recipe of this offering. You're not to add to that offering. You're not to subtract to that offering. Or else it won't be coming out right and God will not bless it. And the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering shall thou prepare with the burnt offering or sacrifice for one lamb. So what we just read now is for a lamb. Or if you bring a ram for, or for a ram. Thou shalt prepare a meat offering, two tenth deals of flour mingled with third part of a hen of oil. And for a drink offering, thou shalt offer a third part of a hen of wine for a, savior, for a sweet savior unto the Lord. And when thou preparest a bullock, so we got a lamb, we got a ram, or we got a bullock. For a burnt offering, for a sacrifice and performing a vow or a peace offering to the Lord. Thou then shalt thou bring with a bullock a meat offering of three tenth deal of flour mingled with half an hen of oil. And thou shalt bring for a drink offering half a hen of wine for an offering made by fire of a sweet savior unto the Lord. Thus shall it be done for one bullock or for one ram or for a lamb or a kid. That would be a kid of the goats, not a child. According to the number that ye shall prepare, 
so shall ye do to every one according to the number. All that are born of the country, you be a citizen, shall do these things after this manner, an offering and offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. All right, so verse 13, if you're born in land, you're born a Jew. Verse 14, of a stranger. All right, here's a Gentile. If a stranger sojourn with you, and more, and whosoever be among you in your generations, and will offer an offering made by fire, of a sweet savor unto the Lord, as ye do, so ye shall do. So that stranger, that Gentile is liking just as much as the Jew as the Jew is liking to the stranger. And you will see this in the book of Acts when you got that Ethiopian eunuch. He's a stranger and he's driving away in his chariot and he's got a copy of the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah or scroll of Isaiah or part of Isaiah. One ordinance shall be both for you of the congregation, Jewish, and also for this stranger, Gentile, that sojourneth with you and orange forever in your generations as ye are so shall the stranger be before the lord those jews were to be that light on a hill to the world when a gentile says hey listen you know what i want to seek god i want to do right name in the syrian there is one god there is one group of people under god that i can go and find out what God expects. And you would go to Jerusalem. You would go to that Jew. You would go to the priest and say, listen, I'm a, I'm a Gentile, but I want to serve God. That Ethiopian eunuch did something like that. Whether it was that time he went to Jerusalem or earlier. So one law, one man it shall be for you and for the stranger that sojourn with you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land, whether I bring you, oh, that's a double kick. Because <laughs> not everybody's going. But there are some going. Keep it up. Keep telling them. All hope is not lost. Though many will go the broad way into hell, there are a few people who are going to go into glory. Keep reminding them what glory is about. What's it say about was it First Thessalonians chapter four about the rapture of church? What's the la very last verse of that chapter? What's the very last verse about the rapture? Say, Comfort one another with these words. Don't give up. You're going. And you figure during the forty years that these nineteen and under would, oh, you're going in. Just wait, patience. And then it shall be that when ye eat of the bread of the land. He shall offer a heave offering, that's up and down with your hands, unto the Lord. He shall offer up a cake of the first of your dough, and a heave offering. That flour that you bring to God, and that is lifted up to God, and again, that goes to the priest. The priests get the first of all the first crops, the first animals. It's the best. As ye do the heave offering of the threshing floor, that would be wheat, barley, so shall ye heave it. Of the first of your dough ye shall give unto the Lord a heave offering in your generations. So here's something that's even more than the tithe. You want to speak about tithing. Everything that first crop that you pick at the beginning of your crops, that goes to God. And from God that goes to the priests. And if ye have erred and not observe all these commandments, which the Lord has spoken unto Moses, you violated. Even all that the Lord has commanded you by the hand of Moses. So whatever Moses has said is just as sound as what God said. Because what Moses said is what God said. Inspiration. Moses has not ever stepped outside the word of God. So when you're reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy... You are reading the word of God. You know, people say man wrote it. Yeah, Moses wrote it. But what did, what did God just say? Everything that Moses spoke is what I spoke. That's not true with Shakespeare. That's not true with textbooks. But the Bible 
Even though the Bible records that someone said a lie, that's God saying, hey, write that in there. Even all the Lord has commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day that the Lord commanded Moses and henceforth among your generations. So Moses is the standard of the law. Then it shall be, if aught be committed by ignorance, that's an important word now, without the knowledge of the congregation, you had no idea, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering. So if the congregation sins, here's a young bullock being offered up for their sin. If they've done it unwillingly, unknowingly, for a sweet savor unto the Lord, with his meat offerings and his drink offering, according to the manner, and one kid, one kid of the goats for a sin offering. So here's a kid of the goat for a sin offering. Here's a bullock being offering to God for the for the nation that sin. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them. You ever look at that word forgiven, what it means? What does it mean that if you have not been forgiven? Then you're not, you're not right. Forgiven is a state that between you and God, it's gone. It's not thought of. Not to be mentioned anymore. Now you can go up to somebody and say, listen, forgive me, I've done you. And they won't forgive you. But we're talking about God here. When you, if you do what God prescribed, of what your actions have been against him to trespass, you do what he prescribed. God forgives you, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. That forgiveness is such a strong word when we look at God. Now, I'm not talking about man. I'm talking about God. Under the blood of Jesus Christ, whatever sin I do, and if, if I'm truly sorry, and if I've done it in ignorance, or even if I've done it because I want to do it, and become sorry later, 1 John 1, 9, if I confess it before God, what does forgiveness mean? God forgets. It's cleansed. It's pardoned. It's never to be mentioned again. And if you're not forgiven as a Christian, You've done things you have not pled, you have not repented, you have not gotten right with God. They will show up at the judgment seat of Christ and they will be wood, hay, or stubble and turn into ashes and a loss. Second John says that we can lose our rewards. Uh, I believe Revelation speaks about seeking all that you can get. That there's a possibility of losing. For it is ignorance. Now here we're going to go with the Old Testament, different from the New Testament under grace. The Old Testament says, listen, if you wanted to do it, there's no relief. And they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire in the Lord. And a sin offering before the Lord for their ignorance. Now you cannot say, oh God, I didn't bring a sin offering. I didn't because, you know, I didn't know I did it. Ignorance is not a word, not a condition, that just because you didn't know. You're free and clear. And the Bible, Genesis, the Revelation, that why men won't read their Bible is when you read your Bible, you know what irritates God. You know where you trespass against God and you are held guilty. And the more you read the Bible, the more you read the Bible, the more you see you trespass against God. And then when you read about that sin that's in your life that you have done, if it's not under the blood, there is no excuse. A Christian has no business, the basic of all sins of the Bible, a Christian has no business lying. Why? Have you ever read John 8, 44? Who is the force? Who is the source? Who is the foundation of lies? Satan. So when you get up and tell your children that there's a Santa Claus Easter Bunny Tooth Fairy, you are on the foundation of Satan. And when you tell stories and you and you got these little antidote kind of things that are not involved in your life, but you apply them to your life and it's a lie, it's a lie. 
And we know John 8.44 says Satan is a lie. So any Christian who has come to John 8.44 and walks away from that lying, you've sinned and you're not ignorant. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger that sojourneth among them. So can you say in the Old Testament under the law that all Gentiles can never be forgiven? All Gentiles are going to, you know, hell based upon their conscience and all that. And Gentiles have no way of seeking God. Not that verse right there. Israel and the stranger. Now, what about the heathen? Well, the Bible says in Romans, by their conscience and knowledge of God, that God's given them. But if you got a Gentile that comes into the nation of Israel, and it's kind of an awkward statement because when you get Jonah and Peter, they are prejudiced against Gentiles, and yet Gentiles can be there. And there are strangers that will come to Jesus in his earthly ministry of the Jews. That will seek him and believe him. And a lot of times he'll say about those strangers, those Gentiles, man, they're a lot better than the Jews. Take note of the centurions in the Bible during Jesus' time. Every centurion is a man that loves Jesus and seeks him. There's a woman. She's a, she's a Gentile. She's seeking God. And Jesus said, hey, you dead dog. You realize what he called that woman? No, I'm here for the lost children of Israel. But, but you know, Jesus, we get the crumbs. Oh, for that, go, your door has been healed. There is hope still for the Israelite and for the stranger in the New Testament. I mean, excuse me, Old Testament. But his sin has, has to be just like the, the Jewish sin, has to be in ignorance. That sojourners among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. They had no idea. You take a, uh, what's the best thing? You take a, a business owner in his dealings with somebody else, not purposely. He has frauded his customer. Let's say he stole. Let's say he did not give that customer the right amount of change. That's stealing. He didn't realize. Maybe he, well, they didn't have computers back there. Maybe, you know, the thing that told him that he needed $2 to get back was actually $2.35. He didn't give the 35 cents. Well, he had no idea that he, he frauded him. And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering. At that moment that you knew that you sinned, even though you didn't know you sinned, at that moment now it becomes sin. James says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him. Now it's sin. You didn't know you did it. Revelation, something comes to you. Oh, man. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly. Look how many times they keep showing up ignorantly, ignorantly, ignorantly. When he sinneth by ignorance. You know what Paul says most sometimes in his writings to the church? I would not have you ignorant. He's quoting from Numbers. Paul does not want you in a condition that you're sinning in ignorance. I want you to know full knowledge of God that you can know before the Lord to make an atonement for him. And it shall be, there's forgiven him. And ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel, Jewish, and for the stranger, non-Jewish, Gentile. That sojourneth among them. You know, you know what Naaman does? He comes back to Elijah and says, listen, your God is God. There's no other God but God. I want to do right, but when I go back home, since I'm a military leader, under my ruler, he's going to bring me into the house of this fallen God that's no God, small g-o-d. And he asks Elijah and says, listen, when I do that, I'm going to go in there by Jehovah. 
And he asked the prophet of God, will God allow me to do this for Jesus? I mean, not for, for Jehovah. I will no more go into that place, even though I have to go there for the fallen God. I'm going to go in there for Jehovah. And he's no more ignorant of Jehovah. He wants to get right. He's a stranger. And so journeyeth among them. Period. We're done. But the soul that doeth ought presumptuously, you want to do it. Whereby he be born in the land, Jewish, or a stranger, Gentile, the same reproaches the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Why? Because he has despised the word of the Lord. So when we sin willingly, because we want to sin, we despise the word of God, the King James 1611 Bible. And have broken his commandment, that soul shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. You die in your sins and you go to hell. In the Old Testament. And when Paul writes to, I believe it's the Ephesian churches, Ephesians or Colossians, there have been deceivers that go into the church and has brought the law back. And under the law, if you sin willingly, you die in your sins and go to hell. So now, under the law, if you bring it into your church, you can say you have no security of a believer. Because look what the law says. Now you got to study to show thyself approved unto God. There's only one Bible that has that. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing. What do I do when, when somebody says, if you sin, you lose it, and you can go to hell? Well, I'll bring you right in, right in the Old Testament under the law. And for the church age, I'll bring you the 1 John 1, 9, where God's faithful and just to forgive. Now, see why I told you, forgive, forgive, forgive. And yet, here is no forgiving, even if you do bring an offering. There is no forgiving. In the Old Testament. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. They found a man gathering sticks upon the Sabbath day. What's wrong with that? Just picking up some sticks. Whatever reason. Doesn't even say why he's gathering sticks. And they found. And they that found him gathered the st gathering sticks. Brought him unto Moses and Aaron. Unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward. Now, I had somebody tell me one time that there is no jails from Egypt to the promised land. There it is right there. There's a jail right there. He's in a kind of, it may not be a jail jail, but he's put in a building where he can't get out. Probably has somebody watching him. And a preacher told me that. Because it was not declared what should be done. So they put him in this room. They confine him. And they're going to bring the cause before Moses and Aaron. And say, hey, we caught this guy. It's the Sabbath day. We know he's done something wrong, but we don't know what to do with him. That's when you call the police. Say, well, what's your emergency? I... There's somebody, I don't know what you guys are supposed to do with him. I don't know what happens with the courtroom. But there's a guy down the street and he's breaking the law. And the cops will come, take him, and put the handcuffs on him, bring him to the police station or, or the jailhouse, and to bring him before the court. This is what's going on here. These people caught him breaking the law. They don't know what to do with him. And they put him in a ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be the man shall be the man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the care. And you say that may be cruel. The law is But 
without Jesus Christ, a man's going to burn in hell for all eternity for being a sinner. God is showing, listen, he's serious. This is serious business. So these churches, the seven-day Adventists, and they got one of their congregation doing work on the Sabbath day. To walk up, I don't know what they call their, their, their pastor and leader of their church, but walk up to them and say, excuse me, how many executions have you had this month? And they'll look at you kind of strange things and all that. Well, did anybody turn the oven on? Because this guy could have been picking up sticks to light a fire to, to have a meal like that woman who's gathering two sticks and is going to make a, a cake and then her son is going to die when Elijah came to her. You see, we can say we're going to follow the Sabbath. We're going to do what the law says as far as the Sabbath. Are you going to kill anybody, execute them because they violated the Sabbath? Why do you put the brakes on where God doesn't put the brakes on. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has a hospital. And they got all kinds of people working on the Sabbath. But they themselves are not working. And yet the Bible says as far as the Sabbath, Thy maidservant, thy manservant, thy ox, thy ass, no one's supposed to work. So when you got someone who's a seven-day Adventist, they are not following the law 100%. And they know what the law says, so they're guilty. They're iniquity upon them. They don't want to trust the, the New Testament and the glorious uh, salvation of Jesus Christ, so God will judge them by the law. The law said that God said, stone them with stones. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, and stone him with stones, and he died, very painful death, as the Lord commanded Moses. I bet you that capital punishment prevent anybody else from doing any work in that camp for a while. <sighs> uh, I don't know what gives it. I'm going to call this guy James. Because James said to him that no do good and do it not. Damn it. Well, I'm going to go out and do something tomorrow. Well, tomorrow's the Sabbath. Oh, yeah, you remember what happened to James? Ooh, better stop. Nope. I'm going to sit down and just eat my manna, which I prepared the day before. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fin fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generation. Through their generations, all the generations to come, the future, that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon. Look how it's spelled there. Ribbon. That's a proper, that's a more better spelling than what they spell it today. Of blue. And so they're going to put a blue ribbon on the bottom of their, their clothing, their, their uh, garments. And it shall be unto you for a fringe. Thank you, Lord. That really helped. That ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes. So Solomon, I'm not going to quote the verse completely. He says, seek not your heart, but trust in the Lord. Taken right out of the book of Numbers. After which he used to go a whoring. So when you see your buddies wearing that blue uh, fringe. And you put your garment on and it's got that blue fringe. That's to remind you of the commandments of the Lord. That's to remind you. You better not sin. Now the church age we are told. We are to remember the Lord's Supper. When we take that cup. And we take that, that bread. We are to remind us of, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's coming again. That you may remember and do all my commandments. And be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's not church. That's not church. It's 
So why fall under the Sabbath? To be your God. I am the Lord your God. Amen.